Hello everyone, my name is Tahani. I'm uh, from the GSL team. I'll be here to support this session and uh, moderate as well. And uh, we've got our lovely speakers here and I'll pass them on to, the, uh, to uh, introduce themselves. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Tahani. Um, absolutely fantastic to be with you all wherever you're dialing in from and whenever you're dialing in from around the world. Um, it's been such a joyful festival so far. And thank you so much to everyone for your contributions and for bringing the young people um, with you. They've kind of blown our minds um, this morning. So, yeah, we're super excited um, to talk to you. Um, it's such a great honour to get to uh, co-host with two absolutely remarkable people. Um, I have just enjoyed getting to know them um, so, so much the last year. They are so incredibly generous. Um, they are wise, uh, they are thoughtful, they are compassionate. And yeah, just been brilliant, brilliant getting to work with them and a great honor to present with them. So first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Matt Lee, who is, a, um, Kind of from the Human Flourishing Programme at Harvard University. Now Matt is the Director of Empirical Research there, but uh, what I think is much cooler is that his nickname is the Professor of Love because that is his real passion, um, the role of love in life and flourishing and in leadership and yeah just amazing amazing work um, in this area, really pushing the idea of um, healthy mature love um, forwards, which is such a gift uh, for the world. And the Human Flourishing Programme at Harvard University, look it up. They are doing incredible work and I love um, every interaction um, that I have one with them. It gives me such optimism um, for the future. Jim Ritchie Dunham, also an academic heavyweight. Um, both obviously have their doctorates, um, but both have done really extraordinary um, research and do connect with Jim on LinkedIn and definitely, definitely read his book, Ecosynomics. It absolutely changed the way that I think about things. So we want to go from a science of scarcity, an approach of scarcity to one of abundance. And we want to be creating um, sacred spaces in which we can co-host with one another. And this is just some of Jim's work. Um, he's doing remarkable work in South America. So do um, look him up. He's really, really improving flourishing globally and is deeply, deeply embedded of this idea of leadership that enables flourishing across communities, across societies, and indeed across the world. So yeah, a massive privilege um, to work uh, with both of these wonderful, wonderful people. And yeah, please do connect with them, look them up, read their work, read their books. Um, you definitely will be pleased that you have done so. <laughs> Over to you, Jim. Thank you so much, Katie. It's a pleasure to work with you and all the amazing work that you're doing through the Oxford Character Project, through the Global Social Leaders, as well as at the school. Um, amazing work. I look forward to learning a lot more in these brief minutes. Um, the question that we're bringing to everybody, and, and it's a question we're working with for ourselves and in our work, is what does it mean to lead to a future you love? He said, what is the thing that I love? Um, and what is it that I give my attention to? And it, we start with this question um, that sort of motivate us in this as leaders at any level, whether it's my marriage, my family, my friends, um, my church, my sports team, my work teams, whatever level of leading what you do, what is it that we're saying yes to? For the love of what future do I choose to give my will? Um, as my friend Orlin Bishop says, um, you're giving your will and to what future are you giving it? And is that a future that you love? So this big question that we're asking is, what is it that is your yes? What is it that you love? What future are you giving your intention to? And does it make a difference? So what we wanna look at with you, do you have a yes? Do you know what it is? What difference does it make if you are aligned with your, if you know what it is and you're aligned with your yes? And how does one go about doing that? And what are we finding out about that? Um, so that led to this big question and the privilege of getting to be here with all of you and Katie and Matt and sharing what we're learning along this path of leading to a future I love. And what is my big yes? And how do I align myself with it? And what difference does that make? So this is fantastic. And would ask Matt in this to get us started. 
um, with a reflection. Well, thank you, Jim. And uh, Jim and Katie, it's such a delight to um, co-host with you both on this um, most important of topics. It's, um, it's been wonderful getting to know both of you and uh, you both have uh, profoundly transformed how I think about leadership and uh, how I understand leadership in my own personal life and in my broader work. So, so thanks to you both. And so, you know, what does it mean to flourish? This is what we're looking at at the Human Flourishing Program. And how do we know? And how do we promote that? Um, it's my belief that leaders help individuals and groups flourish. That's really what makes a leader deeply influential, not just influential in a shallow way, but in a, in a very deep way. And so we're going to start with um, a reflective moment and this is inspired by the work of Fred Rogers, more commonly known as Mr. Rogers, uh, a children's television show host for many years, whose life was dramatized in this uh, fictional account, this film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And in one scene, he asks a rather disgruntled, um, irritated journalist who's uh, trying to find a way to write a critical piece about him. He asks him, you know, would you take along with me one minute to think of all the people who have loved you into being? One minute and I'll watch the time. And this is the turning point in the movie. And this way of relating to abundance rather than scarcity is the turning point in the lives of many leaders. And so it requires a practice. So we will invite you to join us in this practice now. And we have a small group with us in the in the zoom but this video will be viewed by many more and so we're going to leave um, this two minutes of silent reflection in the video so that everyone can follow along and i will i will mark the time so let us take um two minutes and each of us we can reflect on this question who loved you into being and what did they do who helped you to flourish? And what specifically did they do that helped you? And so let's reflect on this. And you can write some notes or silently reflect whatever is comfortable. And we'll do this for two minutes. So that is two minutes and we often don't take time to reflect in um, these kinds of leadership uh, webinars. And so Jim and Katie and I felt that it was important to connect with our own experiences 
as we think about what does it mean to flourish and, and how do we lead people in ways that help them to flourish. So this session is being recorded and it will be posted for, for many people to see. If someone would like to share um, their own reflections on um, what came up for you as, you as you sat with this question, who loved you into being and what specifically did they do? We would welcome that um, at this time. I think I see a hand. Gilda, are you interested in joining us? Yes. Welcome. Yes. You'll, you'll have to unmute. Great. Hi, I have. Great. Wow, what a question. What a question. I have to say for the big part of one minute, I had to really, really think and then all of a sudden I felt overwhelmed um, because for me is my son. Mm. He just literally redefined my why, my purpose and my meaning. And I think he made me grow as a person uh, and I've learned so much. Um, we always underestimate young people and our own kids because we always know best, but they surprise you at every step. So thank you so much, Matthew, because this has been really quite something else. Thank, thank you, you, Gilda. It's so delightful to hear that. And I'll invite um, Katie and Jim to join as well. But um, notice that when we think about leadership, it sometimes might be the person who holds the fancy title at the top of some organizational pyramid. But oftentimes we learn best from children. And I, I just happen to have on my desk, um, this uh, uh, book, Leadership Lessons from Miracle Children by William Considine. And he was um, the longest running CEO of a large hospital system in the United States, happened to be where I lived back in Ohio. Um, and in his role as CEO of Akron Children's Hospital, he learned so much from the kids, especially the ones who um, did not survive their treatments mm -hmm. um, and died young. And he said, you know, the real, the real lessons in life came from these miracle children and what they taught me about leadership and what they taught me about being a human being. And one, um, one example in particular, of a young girl who died at age 13, she was so concerned about the well-being of the doctors and nurses and they had an art class and she spent her time making sun catchers to give to her doctors and nurses to keep their spirits up. And the, the phrase back in that era was about having a bad hair day. This was like a metaphor for being in a bad mood or something, or maybe your appearance wasn't quite right. And so it, it threw you off. And she said, look, I have no time for bad hair days. You know, every moment is precious. And, and William Considine, the CEO took this lesson from this child and it really informed how he led, um, not just his organization, but in his community. So it's really a, a marvelous lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Gilda. Jim or, or Katie, would you want to offer anything? Oh, thank you so much, Matt. What and Jim, uh, what an extraordinary question. Um, I just felt so much love when I thought about that. And it really made me appreciate how generous the people in my life have been and how I can possibly do anything without them. And it just really, really informed um, to me um, how much um, people and community really, really matter and how much love you can get from them. And um, it doesn't matter at all who they are, like you said, their role doesn't matter, their age doesn't matter, um, their background doesn't matter, their level of education doesn't matter at all. It's um, their ability to give you this love, to lift you up, to see the best in you, and to believe in you, to value you, um, is what really, really makes the difference in life. And that was such a lovely reminder that that's definitely the most important thing any of us can do, is just see the very, very best in people and lift them up um, as much as we possibly can. So yeah, recognize their infinite worth, <laughs> not just the, uh, their dignity, but their infinite worth. Wonderful. I see that Jess has a hand up. Jess, welcome. 
lovely. Um, I found that quite emotional as well, really. I wasn't expecting to. Then all of a sudden it was just like, oh. Um, so I mean, obviously like family and friends and stuff, but I um I literally just got my first COVID vaccination. So I was sort of thinking about the NHS as well and thinking about how, you know, everyone just like, you know, pays their tax and does things to their community without knowing exactly where it's going to go. But like the amount of love that's behind that as well. Um, sorry if you can hear sirens in the background, I'm on a really busy road. Um, but yeah, just sort of thinking about what all of us owe to each other all the time and how much we do things every single day without even thinking about it for people that we don't even know. And we all so much we all owe so much to each other that I just think that there's no point in trying to keep any track of it or try and pay any debts. And we can, I think that's the kind of love as well of just the stuff that just stops the chaos happening that we do every single day without without thinking about it so yeah that's what i was thinking about <laughs> that's, that's wonderful thank you jess and for our friends around the world who don't know the nhs is the national health service and i think i'm not i'm not from the country so <laughs> just so so you know so so leadership and love can be expressed in any role in any um context in our families in our workplaces by anybody of any age. And so, you know, we, we demonstrate our leadership in very small ways sometimes, but it's very meaningful. And it's, it's really good to have some space to reflect and contemplate and feel gratitude for the ways in which people are routinely loving us into being. And um, as Katie suggests, um, sometimes people do recognize not just our dignity, but our, in, our infinite worth, our limitless value. And, um, and that's really quite special when, when that happens. And it's good to remember that that does happen. We often um, can be drawn towards the negative, but we can um, spend a few contemplative moments reflecting on the positive as well. Jim, anything to add on this? Um, I, that's great. It was also a wonderful reflection for a couple minutes of who has given me so, so deeply out of their love to for me to get here and <clears throat> from family, friends, you know, lots of folks. So then, I, then the way my mind goes, I started seeing who was standing with me or creating the space for me, who was standing with me, and then who was standing for me in ways that seemed like they were deeply supportive and, and others who were standing in ways that felt like they were um, challenging me or barriers for me or a wall for me to reflect against, but that they stood up and gave me that time. So then I think of like my dissertation committee, you know, and it was a bloodbath, but the whole point was they showed up. They didn't need to, but they showed up so that I was better. And they said, I will take the time for you to stand for you so that you can be stronger. Um, so I thought that was great um, pre-reflection. I see that Amy has her hand up. Yeah, um, it's funny because actually it was uh, for me for university, my first ever tutor in my first ever tutorial meeting at the University of Bristol. Um, he said to me, this is an opportunity in your life to make some of the greatest connections that you'll ever make. So have a really good first year. <laughs> and actually, I am still best friends um, with the most incredible people that are literally like my additional family. And I wouldn't have got through the last been a long time since my first year of university, but I wouldn't have got through the last two decades without them. Um, and it's also where I was lucky enough to meet my husband. So that one piece of advice of just go out and make real connection and really enjoy getting to meet this diverse group of people has really shaped the way that I approach my life now and I'm forever grateful for that that little kind of snippet of advice in life yeah that's who I was thinking about thank you so much Amy I think one of the things that we do in some of my communities is call them treasure hunts and say go out and find these treasures of these relationships that you don't yet know are yours like your future husband or future best friend I said, your best friend might be sitting right next to you and you just don't know it because you're not looking. But ask that question, look for those treasures. Who is ready to love me into being? And it turns out they're all over the place. And I think maybe we'll use that. Anything else, Matt, or we move into the little sharing? No, I, think, I think that's a great um, start. So the whole, the whole point of this is that leadership is partly about contemplative practices 
so that we can notice these kinds of connections. And as Jim was suggesting, um, look at the abundance that's around us and start to look for the treasures and start to help other people find the treasure. So it's not just for us. We want to share the abundance and we want everyone to connect with the abundant. There's plenty of abundance. And so we, it's helpful to have a contemplative practice to um, help us to feel that that's real. I love that, Matt. And to your earliest point is that, and I'm not asking you to spend two hours every day doing this. It was two minutes. And the stories that you already shared, um, you know, and Gilda's and Jess's already, uh, and look what happened, and that was two minutes, right? So if we can build this into our practice, I think this is just an amazing realization of what are all these treasures in my life. So what we wanted to do is spend a few minutes sharing with you from each of our different perspectives, and that was partly why we decided we wanted to do this together, because we come from different uh, traditions, different disciplines. We're in different places and different kinds of organizations looking at these questions and share briefly some of the findings we have of what we're seeing and showing that this is real. And what is the this and that it's real? Um, so I'll start. And basically the main point that I'm finding in my research and in our practice, and what does that mean? So that's in all European Union and the UK and a few countries in Africa now, and most of Latin America, Mexico, US, Canada. So this is, these are findings that we're having in our field work, in our research across the globe. A very simple observation that I'll start with. Um, it's whether you start the day or at any moment in any interaction with yourself, with other human beings, are you starting with a yes or a no? And to make it really basically this dichotomy, you're either starting with a yes or you're starting with a no. And then the question is, what does that yes or no lead to? And what we're finding through this research that I was talking about now in all those countries, 42 countries, as well as our survey research across 125, and you can see all that in my book, which I have a picture of here, Ecosonomics, or on our website, we have a lot of this described is that when you start with a yes, you're saying yes to human creativity. You're saying yes to love. You're saying yes, there is something I care deeply about in the future, um, past the future of right now, um, and I choose to give my intention to it. I choose to give my attention to it. It's something that I want to see happen, whether a Gilda's example, this is with my child, um, or this is with my spouse or my friends, or it's the work that we're doing at GSL, but there's some future that we're saying yes to that deserves my attention. And I'm saying yes to human creativity in that space. I'm saying yes to those treasures. And the observation is, is that when we're not saying yes, we're saying no. And the question is, is why in the world would we do that? And there are a lot of reasons that we can start to unpack, a little bit of which we'll share here. But is there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that happen in human interactions in the way that we're organized as society that take us to the no. And so the question then is, are you consciously choosing your yes, or are you unconsciously accepting your no? And I'll finish that, by, that idea by saying, when you're not, our observation is that when you're not consciously in your yes, or when somebody in your group isn't consciously holding the space of the yes, there's a lot of no leaking in. And so the question isn't, can we be better if we're more generative? Can we be better organizations if we're more engaging? Would it be nicer if we were more flourishing? Is rather to flip that and say, why in the world would we ever say no to flourishing? Why would we ever say no to human creativity? Why would we ever say no to the person who's loving me into being? But we do. And so we know through our surveys and a lot of groups that flourishing is low in many parts of the world or many times in our lives. We all know this from our own experience. We know that a large percentage of the workforce is disengaged at work. And they, we, we position that as it'd be nice if we weren't. And I'd like to suggest that we're going to flip that and say, why in the world would we say no to the human creativity that's already in the room? We've already invited you here. You're already in love with that future with me. You're already bringing your creativity and passion, intention, attention. 
and then I start to shut that down. Second observation is when we say no, or sorry, when we say, I'll start with yes, when we say yes, even if we're not always completely aware of it, meaning I'm not always conscious that I'm doing that, but it's built into the practices. I have a Katie on my team, a Matt on my team, a Gilda, a Jess on my team, a Tahani, that helps us remember our yes. When what we're discovering in all these groups we're working with in our survey is whenever we're working out of yes, the, re the results are always net positive. And what does that mean? We generate more value in the world for all of those participating than we extract. Right? So we, I don't have to compensate you, meaning balance you for all the, the pound of flesh or pound of heart that you gave out of doing something you didn't want to do today. You're better off because you participated. Everybody's better off because they participated. That's what net positive means. More value is generated than extracted. So even when we're unconscious in our or subconscious as individuals in a group that says yes and is working with its group, our research finding is that the result is always net positive. Flip side, when you start with a no, when you accept a no to human creativity, the love, what we've discovered is no matter how hard you work, the result is always net negative. So, and what does that mean? And that's a hard statement, but it is you are extracting more value out of all the participants in the system than you're generating. So the result for it, I'm actually, whenever I restart with or accept a no, I'm always a bit worse off in my thinking, my feelings, my emotion, my desire to continue to be engaged, but I'm a little worse off to a lot worse off for having participated. So they're either starting with a yes or no, your yes or no to human creativity, to the love for that future, to which you're giving your will individually and as a group. If you start with a yes, it always leads to net positive, even if you're subconscious about it and not very good at it. The result is always generative. And if you if you accept that no, then the result is net negative, no matter how hard you try to engage people, because you're still coming from a no. And so the question is, this is always happening. We're finding, and we're finding thousands of groups in hundreds plus countries of people who live from this all day long, that you can live from a yes all the time. And what you can do is, even if I as an individual forget in moments, because I haven't done my contemplation today, our processes and structures as a group support us in remembering that. So I have an agreement with Katie or Matt or Tahani that when I start to fall asleep and don't remember my agreement to yes, it is not nice for you to do. I'm not asking you, please do. It is your responsibility to help me remember my yes. And that's why we're doing this as a group. And so what we found is thousand plus groups that live like this all the time. Everybody knows that they do. Um, everybody in their community and their geography and their industry know that they do. And what we found is they describe them as, well, they're kind of weird. And I say, well, why do you think they're weird? He said, well, because they get these amazing results and I don't really understand how they do it. And, what is, and, and they're lucky. And they said, well, what does lucky mean? He said, well, they get great results doing that weird stuff. I said, well, how long have they been doing this? For like 20 years. I said, so 20 years of sustainably doing something is called sustainable, regenerative, not lucky and not weird, it just means when you look from no, it's very hard to understand what yes looks like. But when you start to look from yes, then all of a sudden, all of these stories that come out, all these treasures start to make a bunch more sense. So what are the practices for this that we're finding? So this isn't what I think they should be because I'm some researcher philosopher. Um, what we're doing in my, our work is going out in the field in all of these countries um, through the survey research and the field work is to find out what these high, these groups who say yes all the time are doing. One of the first things that they, we find is that they see their yes. They can ask questions like we just started with, who's loved you into being? What was that like? Um, what is your yes? Do you know what you really care about? What is your purpose? What is your group's deeper shared purpose? What is it that's actually motivating you to do what you do? What gets your creativity, your love, your intention? So can you see it and can you choose it? So that's a big question for you is, do you know what your yes is? We can call that an, a vocation, an avocation, a pull, a purpose in life. There's all kinds, philosophers across all cultures have always asked this question. 
But for us, it's can you see your yes and can you choose it? Second thing that we're finding that people do is something about living your yes with, and we call it the big yes scorecard. What does your yes look like? What does it look like in your different roles and your different relationships? And what does it look like to say yes? And then how well are you doing at that? What kinds of processes, guidelines can you put in place, agreements with your colleagues to say, I want to, in my relationship with you, come from my yes. And this is what I, I understand that to mean. In my group, in my team, whatever it is, what does my yes look like? And what am I going to do? And when I start accepting a no, then help me stop doing that. Because why in the world would I give all of my love and attention to something that's going to be net negative? So finally, to finish my thoughts up on that, you can take the online survey for free at surveys, Institute for Strategic Clarity.org or is clarity, isclarity.org. Um, there's an agreements health check. You can go in there and see what is the vibrancy that we experience in our, in our agreement. Basically, is it are we starting with a yes or no to ourselves, to others, to the group, to nature, to spirit? Are we starting with a yes? Are we starting with a no? And then what can we do about that? And so you can take the survey for free um, and you can set up in the portal uh, that you can come in and check it as frequently as you want and for as many groups as you want. And that's free online. Surveys.isclarity.org. So anyway, so we've described a little bit of that in the book at the Institute for Strategic Clarity. And these are some of our observations. And what I'd love to do then is to ask Matt to jump in and share some of what you've learned about what, what makes this real, what you're seeing. Great, thank you, Jim. Wonderful remarks. Um, I want to be mindful of the time. When is our session over so that we make sure that Katie has plenty of time as well? What's another the, half um, hour. Another half hour, okay, perfect. Um, so I've prepared seven minutes and I will stop at seven. Um, you know, so, so how do we assess and enhance our flourishing? How do we know whether we're flourishing how do we improve that? And how do we do that for others? How do we really know that what we're doing with them is actually net positive, as Jim would suggest? And I agree. Well, leadership, we have suggested, is about the promotion of flourishing and is therefore an act of love. This might seem strange at first, but in fact, there's a long history of love and related concepts playing an integral role in leadership in a, a variety of contexts, including, you might be surprised to hear, the military. So for example, a US Air Force leadership manual written in 1948 repeatedly used the word love as well as kindness and compassion in conveying the importance of demonstrating to troops that a leader is, quote, vitally concerned with their welfare, end quote. The contemporary version of the Air Force Leadership manual, manual has excised words such as love, opting instead for the language of strategic or tactical leadership, and thereby reducing the po possibility that leaders will create a container that's capable of nurturing the kinds of outcomes that are necessary for full flourishing. To take another example, leaders in the Oakland public schools recognized that love was the foundation of flourishing, as well as overcoming racial disparities in academic achievement and use of disciplinary measures, inequitable use of disciplinary measures. So you can see the title of a book here at the top of this slide, We Dare Say Love. Um, support in the subtitle supporting the achieve supporting achievement in the educational life of black boys. So there were um, such problems in this school district to the point that the federal government had to step in and demand changes through a legal process. And the response was um, just to to cut to the chase. We don't love our kids and we need to learn how to do that. And they brought in people from the community who were not credentialed through the educational credentialing process, but they knew how to listen and they knew how to love. And that made a remarkable difference. So I would submit that the Air Force once understood this, the Oakland Public School District um, rediscovered it. And it's a lesson that you see either being 
learned and practiced or not everywhere in the world right now. So we can start to measure um, you know, outcomes in terms of whether people are, are truly flourishing. If you would like some examples of measures, um, I can put in the, um, in the chat box a link to download for free without cost. It's an open access volume. Our measuring well-being book um, recently published by Oxford. So there's the link. And um, you're welcome to peruse this interdisciplinary conversation involving social scientists, philosophers, theologians, and um, a number of specific measures, including a measure that I helped to co-develop on inner peace. And you know, we often neglect the experience of inner peace as a manifestation of flourishing. Um, but if we're truly flourishing, we're not just racing from one project to another in a, in a very um, disorganized way that causes physical and emotional problems for ourselves and others. So we need to find some balance. And you know, how do we measure flourishing, for example? Well, um, the Flourishing app, which, I've, um, which I'll all, also offer in the chat box that our program has developed, it's a free app. You go to our website. You can use it anytime. If you want to sign up for um, a, an account, you can track your flourishing over time, but that's not necessary. You can use it without signing up and without paying anything. And you can self-assess, according to 12 questions, um, your flourishing and, and get a reasonable snapshot, which is not um, the final a uh, bit of data that you'll need in your life, but it starts a conversation with family and friends and invite others to take this and then discuss with them their results and your results and figure out how to love each other into being more effectively. And we offer as these little icons at the top of the page suggest a number of um, activities that have been shown through research to improve one or more domains of flourishing. Uh, we did a little bit of gratitude slash savoring um, at the start of this event today. And so we, we walk you through these practices, best possible self activity, character strengths activity, kindness activity, other kinds of activities that can make a measurable difference on a number of your flourishing domains. And you can track that over time. Um, we also have in the Measuring Wellbeing book, a measure of community well-being, because it's not enough just for me to, to cope with um, unhealthy dynamics and try to be resilient and flourish, but ideally we want to create flourishing communities where the conditions of the soil are so rich that we all thrive quite naturally together. And that's what this um, rather complicated looking figure is trying to convey here, that if we are um, stuck at the bottom, and steward means steward of the system. So what's the broader system uh, and how is that functioning? And what's the leader's responsibility for the functioning of the larger system? If we're stuck at the bottom, reproducing trauma and exclusion, even as we try to respond to specific crises, we're really reproducing an adversity economy, an economy that moves around resources, um, re trying to respond reactively to crises, but never uh, fully shifting that dynamic. And so stewards of the system must do more to expand the conditions at the top, which are rooted in dignity and inclusion and foster certain vital conditions for all people that unlock the potential of everyone to live into their big yes. And when we do this, we leave the suffering spiral and we start to join the thriving spiral. And it's the leader's job to see this very clearly. How is the work of my group contributing to a suffering spiral or a thriving spiral? And how can I, that's a tall order for me to move from the bottom to the top. So how can I do that? So that's where contemplative practices come in. The reality is you're already doing it. You just have to notice how and why and what. And so the tree of contemplative practices, and this is my last point, is available at the Center for Contemplative Mind. And I'll put this in the chat box as well. In my undergraduate class, we just sort of walked around this tree throughout the semester doing something on each of the branches um, at the beginning of our classes. And we discovered that we're able to learn better 
together when we have engaged in this contemplative grounding centering kind of exercise and then we can take on the very difficult challenges before us with greater clarity and with the sense of inner peace or inner calm and i would direct people a lot of these things are rather secular in orientation there are specific religious traditions that offer practices as well so i'm helping this group discovering prayer um, develop a, an assessment process of a, a particularly christian um, uh, contemplative practice that they're fostering online and so there you can also engage as a leader you can engage people where they're at and offer them um, opportunities to practice in ways that are consistent with their own tradition whatever it might be all of this is about recognizing our responsibility to be a good steward of the system and help unlock the potential that allows everyone to live into their big yes. So I think Katie is up next. That's what I will offer um, at this point. Wow, thank you so, so much, um, Matt and Jim. Oh gosh, I don't know how to follow that, <laughs> but I'm gonna give it a go. Um, and yeah, thank you so, so much for your words. Um, just, yeah, words don't really have the, the right expression, but I know that everyone's been really, really moved um, by what you said. So I'd like to talk a little bit just about the science. So um, I think this is really interesting and I think it's really relevant because I think sometimes leaders hesitate because they think, oh, should I be compassionate or should I be assertive and dominant and just tell people what to do? Hurrah, follow me. Um, and is this actually a better way of doing things? And if I'm compassionate, will I be seen as soft and weak and fluffy? And my answer to you is absolutely not. No, being compassionate, being loving and um, saying yes to what really, really matters and not to those urgent market driven matters is what makes you a true leader. Compassion is also incredibly good for us. It's so good for our health. I love the work of this professor, um, Paul Gilbert, who's based in Nottingham, and his book is fabulous, The Compassionate Mind. And he fundamentally says that people function best when they're loving, affiliative and caring and when they feel loved and valued. This is not a surprise, but I think as leaders, we need to remember this. And in whatever role we are in in life, just remembering that when we are loving, and when we receive love, uh, life is an awful lot better. <laughs> Next slide, please, Jim. Yeah, and so why is this? And there's some quite exciting new science on this for all you kind of scientists out there who are like, well, the philosophy is really nice and that's great and I love the idea, but actually show me the data. Well, um, this really cool guy called um, Paul Zak um, started looking at oxytocin in quite some detail um, in relation to trust and relationships. And he's applied that a little bit um, to leadership as well. And what he's found is that there are, um, when we are in a loving, affiliative relationship, when we care for each other, when we give an act of kindness, when we receive an act of kindness, um, we actually release oxytocin. So it's not just when women give birth um, that they release oxytocin, but actually it's, um, it happens much more than that. And these are some of the absolutely fabulous benefits. And I'm just gonna let you read these because as a leader, this is definitely what we want for ourselves and for our people. Next slide, please, Jim. And this is another one of my favorite researchers in this area. Um, Dacher Keltner, and um, he's at the Greater Good Science Center at the University of California, Berkeley. So do look him up and look up um, his, his work. And his fundamental um, philosophy now is that the normal interpretation of the survival of the fittest is totally wrong. And he came to this conclusion, um, particularly through his study of the vagus nerve. Now the vagus nerve is the wandering nerve and it starts up top of your um, neck and it wanders through all your major organs. You can see it on the left-hand side. And the exciting thing that he found was that when we're compassionate, when we experience compassion, when we give compassion, 
the vagus nerve, um, the tone of it actually strengthens. And that has all sorts of extraordinary health benefits, which is just fabulous. Um, next slide, please, Jim. So his conclusion is it's not the survival of the fittest. That is so outdated, but it's the survival of the kindest. Um, next slide, please, Jim. And here are just some of the um, references um, so that if you're watching this back, you can press pause and go and uh, look this up and find out more about the science if that's what works for you. Um, I'm sure that you can absolutely um, see that it makes sense. It's totally common sense. But actually, I love the fact that biology and neuroscience and psychology is all coming together to really, really support the idea that love matters. Love is the most important thing um, in leadership and indeed in life. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's have a look at some practices. Um, we've got loads and loads and loads of practices in a book that I was really fortunate uh, to write with um, the wonderful Emmy Bidston, who I think is um, in the Zoom room uh, right now. And um, we put loads of practices in there because we're both teachers and we wanted uh, things to be practical and for you to try them out. Um, and one practice we'd love to offer for you um, to show that you love someone is to listen and to listen with your full attention and with the intention to understand fully as well. And we saw that actually on Matt's beautiful tree. So we just request that while you listen to someone, aim to see the world as they see it. Can you get into you know, that classic metaphor? Can you get into their shoes? Can you be fully open to them? And most importantly, while you're listening to them, are you listening with the intention to celebrate their infinite worth as human beings. Thank you so much. That's fantastic, Katie. Thank you so much, and Matt. Matt, um, we have 12 minutes left, a, a couple minutes maybe for this reflection. Sure, so I think um, getting um, back into the experience of our big yes, um, is, is really helpful and doing this regularly. So this is a question you can reflect on every day and it can, you know, can be a, a reminder of when you have been fully alive and what's happening there. You, you know, we often have these experiences and then we forget about them and then 40 years later say, oh yes, that was, that was a marvelous experience. But, but regularly calling this into into our um, memory is is really important and leadership is as we've said best when it's contemplative so we'll now give you a moment to recall a memory and savor it as both a cognitive and an emotional experience so notice how you felt so this is the question and you know th this is alex honnold from the movie the documentary free solo he climbs tall mountains without ropes um, this is not a peak experience for me, but this is this is him being fully alive. This is his big yes, and uh, and he's figured out how to do it skillfully. Um, so you can reflect on a high point in your own life, a peak experience in which you felt truly alive, perhaps something you feel you were born to do. So again, we'll take um, maybe just a minute this time and um, reflect on this what you know what is this memory and what did it feel like and what was happening there Okay, that is 
one minute. And so as Jim was pointing out, these practices don't take a lot of time and they don't take any money at all. Um, but it's, it's helpful for us to reconnect with those moments when we really felt truly alive. So a couple of questions before we invite um, someone to share. Does this kind of experience happen when you are leading, when you see yourself as in the role of, of a leader? And then does it happen for those that we are leading? When do we notice that we're fully alive? And what, you know, what's happening there and how does that relate to leadership? So, so I would be um, very curious about any sharing that um, anyone in the Zoom would like to offer now, because we have um, felt from our own experience that this is worthwhile, but we want to learn from the collective wisdom of the group. So if anyone is willing to share what their experience of being truly alive was like, um, please feel free to raise a digital hand and you'll show up at the top of the screen. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. Hi, hi, Matthew. Thank you very much. What a wonderful session and great, great questions have jumped out at me. Um, the, the, the thing that comes to my mind when you ask that question, and I think that's what's the interesting bit, um, was a, a long time ago, but I looked after a guy who had MS, who was sort of aged around sort of 40. So like this year I'm turning sort of 40, but we hung out in Lourdes and I looked after him for a week. But particular night it's like the last night and um uh you know he, he wants to go out for some drinks and have some beers I was like oh, is that good for your medication kind of thing and he was like well I've spoken to my doctor my doctor said you know am I going to get better if I don't drink and um he was like no he's like all right well can I have a few beers then on the odd occasion and he was like yes actually no good question and I agree on sport so during that week, there was just a few occasions where I suppose I felt alive, I put the world to rights, and he almost made me think about the value of life. And I suppose almost being, I was almost meant to be looking after him, being of service to him, but I felt that I found out, you know, what was valuable in life. And I got so much from just life experience of talking to him and hearing his life and what he'd done and what he achieved and what his views were. So um, a bit of a random one, but it was just, you know, when you asked that question of a high point, you know, randomly it was having a beer um, with, with him in, in Lourdes was probably a high point in life. Um, and probably something around that kind of how do you create opportunities for people? And that's probably what inspires me a bit around the work we do is almost how do we support young people to have access to good opportunities, like, you know, and, and life changing opportunities. That's a, that's a wonderful um, example, and uh, I'm just smiling quite a lot about this. You know, what, what comes up for me in terms of two connections to leadership, one is that leadership is a capacity that's present in a group. It's not vested in one person, and the leader's job is to unlock this capacity. And so your willingness to listen, um, you know, going back to Katie's exercise, your willingness to listen to what was needed in that moment um, and, and to empower um, your, um, your group, it was a group of two, but to, to notice and listen and empower your group of two to do what is needed in that moment was a, a great unlocking of the leadership potential so that you were learning. And, and the, leader, the leader always learns. Bill Considine learned from these young kids. Um, the, the leader unlocks the possibility that everyone can lead, and then we're all learning together. And that's, that's moving us closer to something that's net positive and not just something that the leader is directing that other people are going along with. We're starting to clarify what is the big yes in this moment. And I think, I think you discovered the big yes in that moment and, uh, and lived into it. So your, your flexibility um, was was really important, and the and again the listening that you did uh, su such a wonderful example. So I'll I'll leave it at that, Jim or, or Katie. Um, Matt, I was I took up your example about a year ago when you shared the, this exercise, and I've been using it 
in um, working with different groups as well as with my graduate students starting um, say take two minutes to share with three or four other people in a group you know breakout room um, your peak experience and the feedback i've gotten from all of the groups so far in the last year is i learned more about these three other people than i have in the last two years as part of the same cohort so we spent a lot of time together um, and I learned more about you and connected with you more in the last two minutes than I did in any of the other things. So to me, to your point and to Katie's exercises is when we can shine with our full love, with our beingness, people are like, going, I didn't know that about you. And, and it's not a surprise, but I can connect with you far more because you took the vulnerability to share something that is your big yes. So sharing our big yes is I just learned more about you in two minutes than I did in two years. So anyway, that, that's fantastic. Was there a comment in the chat or? <laughs> so Jim, just very briefly, so what are the processes and practices that we can use to reveal each other's big yes? And this is one of them and it doesn't cost any money and you don't have to hire a consultant. And, you know, it's, it seems unrelated to leadership at first, but discovering each other's big yes is imperative for unlocking the leadership capacity that's present in the group. And so we can use these kinds of practices to radically transform the culture because the culture is oriented, you know, in a conventional way towards closing down this kind of no, we shouldn't know about each other's personal business or something. Somehow that's unprofessional. I've heard this before. And when we actually do this work, we find out that it helps teams become much more effective because they can draw upon an understanding of what this person's big yes might be. I love that. And I would sort of summarize that in the way that my friend Orland, who I quoted in the beginning, um, says, if you're not using your will towards your yes, somebody else is. So your will is always being used. And the question is who's using it and if it's your yes and you're aligned then you're using it if not then somebody else is and then that can be extracted right of then that's just why it's always a net negative because it's not part of my yes but i i, I succumb or submit to it um, those are fantastic so what the invitation to everyone is in the last two minutes is we've shared some practices um, that you can try um, and we welcome you to go try them on your own and also with the three of us as well as each of our own organizations and the way we're coming together around leadership for flourishing which katie is also co-leading is then share with us what you're learning um, as my, matt just said it's really critical for us in our own practice as individuals as groups and in our research to find out what you're learning so please go try these practices for yourself um, if you want to share with them with us we're very welcome to, to do that either through our institutional links or the emails which we put in the this presentation also we've shared some readings that you can go do to learn more you can start with our books or our websites um, that we've also shared here and um, i call those curiosity dives those are the places to start your dive into your curiosity and would love for you also to share with us where that took you he said if you find other resources like katie shared the oxytocin he said i found this he said please share that stuff um, more people looking is fantastic. And we also have the free surveys you can take to assess yourself, as Matt was just saying. What is our level? What is our level as a group? Is this where we want to be as individuals and as a group? And how are we doing? So that I can be, confirm and reaffirm my yes. And, and what am I giving my yes to? Um, so that's fantastic. And Matt, Katie, any last things in the last minute? Thank you so much. Just a big, big, big yes to getting to work with both of you and to be able to collaborate on Global Social Leaders. So massive, massive thank you uh, to both of you and to all of our participants and their um, beautifully insightful and open uh, contributions. Yes, just looking forward to further adventure and treasure hunting with you both <laughs> and everyone else on, on involved. Wonderful. And thank you so much to Hani for supporting us in, in, in this process also. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. This was a very, very inspiring and, and quite moving, actually, uh, with lots of curveballs that we did not expect today. Uh, but it, it's been very, very valuable for me personally, and I'm sure for everyone else that was um, here. I would like to thank you all for your time and um, and all the information that you've shared and all the resources that you've shared as well. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful, beautiful session. Um, I think that especially that, that first um, practice with who loved you into being, that hit everyone, uh, including myself, um, quite uh, hard. Uh, one of the comments actually that I had, that I didn't get a chance to say at the beginning um, regarding that, um, who loved you into being, it's external. But one of the persons that came up when I was thinking about that was also myself. Uh, Self-love is such a big thing. And and Jim, what you were saying earlier about um, viewing from a no, if you don't know and connected with yourself, how would you be able to externally feel that love and that guidance? And that's something that I personally learned in my journey. So, uh, you know, that, that, that was a great uh, connection to make there. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say that before <laughs> the session ended. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, I think that's it. So what I'll do is I will close the chat unless anyone else has anything to say. <laughs> Thank you for all who have attended. Um, this video will be posted uh, on our website after, so you can come back if you've missed anything. Um, more than welcome. Okay, take care. Bye. Thank so Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.